Thank you, everyone, for sticking around. Uh, because we are local here, if anyone needs recommendations for dinner tonight, be sure to let us know. We can give you some good places. There are good places to eat in Baltimore. Um, these are my disclosures. I do speak for Gore, and they produce a bioresorbable mesh. I will be discussing their product as well as other products commercially available. So there's plenty of data to support the use of synthetic permanent mesh in ventral hernia repair. For example, this study from 2016 utilized the Denmark registry, including all elective incisional hernia repairs from 2007 to 2010, with the goal of comparing mesh repairs, both open and lap, to non-mesh repairs. The primary endpoint was five-year reoperation for recurrence. The results are right, quite compelling. The overall recurrence without mesh was 18.3%. With mesh, those numbers dropped to 13.2% and 11.2% for open and lap repairs, respectively. The cumulative risk of reoperation was 17.1% without mesh. That same study highlights reasons mesh isn't so great. There were 2.7% more patients in the mesh group that required a reoperation for complications. So long term, are the benefits of reduced recurrence rates with permanent synthetic mesh offset by the complications? Maybe biologics are the answer. There have been many claims regarding them. They stimulate regeneration, allow for revascularization, resist infection as immune cells can infiltrate the mesh to defend against bacterial load, and they have less complications. Honestly, we don't have time to go into whether all those are true, but assuming there's support for many of those claims, does a biologic get the job done? Studies suggest yes. This study was actually just published. They evaluated their prospective database. They had 229 patients with a median follow-up of almost 21 months. Overall recurrence rate was 11.8%. This is comparable to the study I just mentioned. Thus, in patients where synthetic permanent mesh doesn't seem to be a good option, a biologic may be a reasonable choice. Your administration will be unhappy with you if you overutilize this option, however. This retrospective study utilizes the INQIP database. They found that in low-risk patients, i.e. clean cases, the rate of wound occurrences and complications were identical to those with synthetic meshes. However, the 180-day costs were significantly higher in the biologic group, about $16,000 higher. Bringing us to our current subject, are bioresorbable meshes the interface between synthetic permanent meshes and biologics? Can they provide the benefits of a biologic in a cost-effective way and give durable results? First, what are they? I think it's important to understand the differences between the currently available products. Our, our oldest, excuse me, <clears throat> our oldest and cheapest option is Vicryl mesh from Ethicon. So this is 92% polyglycolic acid, 8% polylactic acid. It has 23% of its tensile strength at two weeks, and full resorption is seen by two to three months. Commonly used for damage control measures for temporary closures, it has been associated with a high fistula rate formation when used intraperineal. Next, there's BioA mesh. This is a product from Gore. It is composed of 67% polyglycolic acid, 33% trimethylene carbonate. Um, resorption is via hydrolysis and enzymatic degradation and occurs by six months. How does this perform different than a biologic? This preclinical study compared BioA to three different biologic meshes by implanting them in rabbits. The meshes were then explanted and evaluated at different time points. BioA reached a higher grade of cellular ingrowth overall and exhibited a significant increase compared to the biologics. The biologics remained relatively steady in contrast. There was also vascular ingrowth observed, with BioA reaching a score of 4.4, which was significantly higher than any of the biologics. This held true for collagen deposition as well. Not only did it have a greater collagen deposition, this appeared much earlier than seen in the biologics. How does this product hold up in a contaminated field? 
The COBRA study was a multi-center prospective study that included hernias of at least nine centimeters squared that were CDC class two or three with a primary endpoint of two-year recurrence. You can see 77% of the cases were type three wounds, while 23% were type two. The characteristics that made these fields clean or clean contaminated varied, but the most common was GI surgery, including bowel resection, ostomy creation, or takedown. There were complications, of course. The SSI rate was 18%, and 6% of the patients formed seromas. The recurrence rate was 17%. Now note, three of these were peristomal hernias. If you include only midline hernias, the recurrence rate is 14%. Ultimately, the conclusion was that repair of contaminated ventral hernias with BioA is a reasonable alternative to biologics. If you're familiar with BioA, it's a very stiff cardboard-like piece of mesh. Inform just recently became available. It's, it's the same formulation as BioA, but it's a soft, pliable format that may be more amenable to a laparoscopic approach. Our next bioabsorbable mesh is Tiger Matrix, made by Novus Scientific. This is actually knitted from two fibers. The first is a copolymer of polyglycolide, polylactide, and polytrimethylene carbonate. It's a mouthful. This fiber loses most of its mechanical strength in two weeks and is fully resorbed in four months. The second is a copolymer of, copolymer of polylactide and polytrimethylene carbonate. Uh, this fiber loses mechanical strength at nine months and is fully resorbed in three years. In preclinical trials, it has demonstrated superior collagen deposition compared to a controlled polypropylene mesh. Here at four months, you can see the histological difference between the two. At 24 months, you see phagocytic activity, and at 36 months, there are just fiber remnants remaining of the mesh. Tiger Matrix has been compared head-to-head -head with biologic mesh in abdominal wall reconstruction. This study evaluated 39 patients with a mean follow-up of 12 months. They found a recurrence rate of 13% for Tiger Matrix compared to 19% for biologic. Additionally, use of Tiger Matrix demonstrated a 70% cost savings. Next, we have Phasix made by Bard Dayball. This is a knitted monofilament mesh scaffold of poly-4-hydroxybutyrate. This is a substance that's actually produced by E. coli via fermentation and resorbed through hydrolysis. Phasix maintains mechanical strength 12 to 26 weeks and is completely resorbed by 18 months. Histology and preclinical studies also demonstrates collagen deposition and blood vessel ingrowth. The pilot study evaluated its use in ventral incisional hernia repair when placed in a retrorectus position. These, these cases were clean or clean contaminated and the follow-up period was 24 months. 31 patients were enrolled. The most common adverse event was seroma and no hernia recurrence, recurrences were observed. A prospective multi-institutional study has been conducted. In this study, the mesh could be placed in a retrorectus or an onlay position. These were clean cases, but considered high risk based off other factors such as obesity, smoking status, and diabetes. They found a rather low recurrence rate of 9% and a reoperation rate of 8%. So, these have all demonstrated reasonable clinical outcomes, at least in certain settings. The question is when to use these products over another. What is the ideal patient population? I want to touch briefly on some of these groups. When you make an enterotomy, you're facing these choices. So you could abort the case, you could repair primarily, continue with definitive repair with permanent mesh, consider using a biologic, or consider a bioresorbable mesh. Well, what we do know about this situation, uh, this study utilized the America's Hernia Society Quality Collaborative to examine 30-day outcomes in ventral hernias with and without inadvertent enterotomies. Nearly 6,000 records were analyzed. Not too surprisingly, the group who suffered enterotomies were more likely to be undergoing repair of a recurrent hernia, to have a larger hernia, and to have a history of abdominal wall infection. The overall incidence of enterotomy was 1.9%. 
Some form of mesh was utilized in 85% of the interotomy cases. 74% of this time of, of the time this was a synthetic mesh. The real question is, should we be afraid to use mesh in these fields? The answer is probably. There was four times the SSI rate in the interotomy group. 20% of the interotomy patients had a surgical site occurrence requiring procedural intervention. There was a significant difference in reoperations, readmissions, and even mortality. Further studies need to be done to weed out whether a biologic or a bioabsorbable mesh affects these outcomes. For me, I'm not willing to take the chance and I'd prefer to proceed with a repair with mesh reinforcement. So I think bioresorbable meshes are a good affordable option in this situation. Dr. Holden is going to speak more to you about the options for infected fields later. So what about repairing hernias in women who plan to have more children? Pre-pregnancy hernia repair is subjected to pregnancy-induced physiologic changes. This may place the patient at increased risk for recurrence or for chronic abdominal pain. If this is true, then it leaves us with a potential algorithm that looks like this. Obviously, if the patient thinks they're done with child rearing, no plans for future pregnancy, you proceed with the definitive repair. If they have any plans to have more children um, and they're asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic, it would be reasonable to discuss a watchful waiting strategy with them when a plan for definitive repair after they're done having children. Um, but of course, if they're really symptomatic and it's affecting their quality of life, you'll want to effectively counsel them and then proceed with the repair. First, is this a reasonable concern to be having? Well, this meta-analysis looked at ventral hernia recurrences in this patient population. The pooled incidence of ventral hernia recurrence following pregnancy was 12%. This was only 9% for those that didn't go on to have a pregnancy, suggesting that it may be better to avoid definitive repair in this patient population. In those cases where the patient feels they are so symptomatic that their quality of life is affected, repair with a bioresorbable mesh may be an alternative to placing a permanent synthetic that you know is high risk for recurrence. Um, so I think it's a, it's a reasonable option here. We're going to hear more on the legal environment surrounding mesh, but it's certainly contributing to patient distrust. I have an increasing number of patients that simply don't want a permanent synthetic mesh placed in them. There's also patients that feel that maybe they have an allergy to the mesh and maybe it's actually been confirmed. Whatever their aversion is, it's important to have an efficacious solution for them. So this may be a patient population to consider a bioresorbable mesh as well. So back to the question of who is the appropriate patient population for these implants. I think we definitely need more research to answer that question. But for me, a bioresorbable is a reasonable choice for any of these situations. So in conclusion, synthetic meshes may not always be the best option. Bioabsorbable meshes provide an alternative to synthetic meshes that certain patient populations may benefit from, and more research is needed to define best practices. Thank you.